Hello everyone and welcome to a very interesting game from last year's Russian Team Championship. It's uh, Sergei Rublevsky versus Kirill Alexenko and as everyone is uh, discussing who should get the final spot in the candidates tournament to be the wild card, whether it should be Kirill Alexenko who qualified via the uh, Fide Grand Swiss or uh, Maxim Vashiela Grav who is uh, almost qualified via any, any other means. Uh, uh, we, we're we gonna check out this game first and then I have, um, uh, I prepared for you an open letter to the Russian Chess Federation uh, from MVL's manager, uh, so uh, we're gonna discuss that a bit more. But before that, here's uh, one of the nicer games I found uh, since we didn't cover all that many games by Alexenko uh, to see uh, what he can do here. It's a really exciting game. Uh, Rublevsky is a, is a pure attacker and he really goes for Alexenko and, uh, well, you just uh, have to see what happens. So Rublevsky opens with e4. Uh, we have c5 by, by Alexenko. Uh, he goes for the Sicilian defense. We have knight to f3, d6, and d4. Uh, captures, captures, we have knight to f6, knight to c3, and a6, the knight of defense, and it's interesting, uh, both Rublevsky and Alexenko uh, are fond of the knight of defense. We have bishop to e2, uh, e5 now, uh, pushing the knight back, knight b3, and bishop to e7, preparing to castle, uh, so both players just castle, and here rook to e1. The idea is you're going to place the bishop to f3, uh, the e4 pawn will be nicely protected, and the bishop, knight, queen, and pawn will be uh, participating in the battle for the d5 square, preventing black from pushing d5. So bishop to e6, uh, just developing, gaining more control of the d5 square, white does the same. Now the d5 square is nicely uh, covered, knight beat the d7 and a4 now, preparing b, uh, preventing b5. Uh, we have queen to b8 by Alexenko. Uh, you will at some point uh, remaneuver this bishop through d8 to b6. It will be very strong. Put, it will put pressure uh, on the f2 pawn, but also uh, gain more control of the c5 square. So h3, making some room for the king, also taking away the g4 square from uh, Alexenko's pieces, and now rook to c8. Uh, we have knight to d2. Uh, the knight is uh, coming to f1, from f1 he, uh, the knight can come to g3 or uh, just control the e3 square so you can develop the bishop to e3 to counter black's dark square bishop uh, when it comes to b6. So bishop to d8, black continues with his plan, we have knight to f1 and bishop to b6. And here uh, Rublevsky goes a5, pushes the bishop further back, bishop to d4 and now you don't want to play bishop to e3 right away. First you want to improve your position as much as possible, knight e2. Now again you threaten the bishop, bishop back to c5 and only now bishop to e3 that the knights are uh, nicely placed. With b6 now uh, defending the bishop, also putting pressure on the a5 pawn, a captures, queen captures and now b3. Uh, so the b2 pawn is no longer a target and a5. Uh, and here we have knight e to g3. Now the knight can come to f5, so uh, Alexenko prevents it with the g6. Uh, and uh, here we have knight to f5. And this is something uh, that uh, Rublevsky prepared for this game. And it's a really, really exciting move. I forgot to mention we already had a new move uh, in the position. Uh, this is move 20, was actually on move 16, so we're just gonna, I'm not gonna uh, 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 move it backwards, but basically four moves have al already been played. Uh, since it was, okay, I'm just going to show it. It was in this position after bishop to d4, uh, knight to d5 was a known move. Uh, it was actually played by uh, Alexenko himself against Alexei Sarana, and Alexenko lost that game. So here, knight to e2 is basically uh, the poison that Rublevsky brought to this game. And now we already saw bishop c5, bishop e3, b6 captures, queen captures, uh, and now uh, b3, uh, taking care of the weakness, a5 and knight, to G, knight e g3. Now we reach this position where g6 was played, Alexenko prevents knight to f5, but uh, Rublevsky plays it anyway. And here uh, is uh, really a position for you to enjoy. Uh, you can pause the video and try to figure out if it's okay to capture the knight while I give you a couple of seconds. Or, you know, take as much as you want. Uh, so for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on figuring out that it's most definitely not okay to capture the knight. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, uh, well, if you capture the knight, then e captures, opens up an attack on the bishop and the rook. And you might think, well, okay, two pieces for a rook, uh, I'm game. Uh, so bishop captures on f5, bishop captures on a8, and the rook captures on a8. So yes, you have two pieces for a rook. The problem is white has queen f3 with an attack on the bishop and the rook. 
Uh, but black has a response to that as well. Bishop e4 takes care of both threats. But now white has bishop captures on c5, attacking black's queen and also introducing another attacker to the bishop on e4. So here, uh, whatever you do, uh, white will just be better. But uh, basically, if you play something like queen captures on c5, rook captures on e4, knight captures on e4, queen captures on e4, the material is completely equal. However, the rook is hanging and also there's the threat of queen to g4 check which picks up the knight on d7. So you have to defend both threats, you move the rook, defend the knight, but still, queen g4 check, king h8 or f8 doesn't even matter and knight e3. And if you look at this position, uh, black, uh, the black king is, uh, well, uh, wide open, the knight is coming to f5, it will be very difficult for black to defend this. So this is uh, this is the position you get if uh, black plays uh, perfect defense after accepting the knight sacrifice, which, uh, as you can see, the material on the board now is equal after some 10 moves. So it's not really a sacrifice, but uh, basically with perfect play, uh, black will be lost. So you cannot capture the knight. So I'm, I, I can only imagine uh, Alexenko uh, took his time to, to decipher this position. He played rook to d8. He uh, continues the fight for the, for the d5 square. Uh, we have uh, g4 now. Now the knight can definitely not be captured uh, with with the pawn because after, uh, well, you'll just see king h8 was played, knight 1 uh, to g3, getting the other knight. And now if you capture the knight, you just get e captures and the bishop is trapped. So uh, the bishop hangs and also you, you can just uh, uh, go, go for the rook. So not really. Uh, d5 will be played then e, uh, f captures on e6. So not really gaining anything. So bishop captures on e3 first by Alexenko, knight captures on e3, and now knight to c5. So uh, again, trying to reach that d5 square, but g5, removing one of the defenders of the d5 square, uh, we have knight back to g8, and now uh, bishop to g4. And here you could trade if bishop captures, queen captures, it's possible. However, white will get uh, too many squares after the queen moves, the knight can come here, the knight can come to f6. It's uh, not going to be a pleasant position for black to defend. So here, uh, Alexenko played f6 and he allowed uh, white to gain complete control of the d5 square and also win a pawn. So here, uh, Rublevsky played bishop captures on e6, we have knight captures on e6, and now knight to d5. Not a very complicated line, so it's very interesting to see what Alex Alexenko had in mind when he, when he played f6. So the queen is under attack, the battle for d5 square is over, white won that battle. Queen to a7, and now g captures on f6. So grabbing a pawn and already having a pass pawn on f6. Rook to f8, now preparing to win back the pawn, but uh, Rublevsky just goes rook to e3. And here uh, you could capture the pawn, but if you capture the pawn, you get knight captures, rook captures, and queen captures on d6. So you lose the d6 pawn, and there are no good discoveries with the knight. So again, uh, you're just in a... Uh, in a worse position with uh, being down a pawn. Uh, but it's definitely playable and it's uh, probably what what uh, you, you could have gone for. Knight to f4, also very interesting. But Alexenko goes for queen to f7. Uh, and now comes knight to e2. Here white just prepares f4. Uh, we have knight to g5 by Alexenko and now knight to b6. Putting pressure on the rook here. Rook a to d8 and now uh, f4. So what do you do here? Here, uh, Alexenko has to make a decision, uh, and basically the decision is whether you move the knight somewhere uh, and allow uh, white to, to start marching those pawns forward, or do you capture the pawn, or maybe you play something else. So basically, uh, if you capture e captures on f4, you're going to get knight captures on f4, and if knight captures on f6, queen d4, just opening up this diagonal, and it's not going to be uh, pleasant for black. The rook is coming to f1, the knight is coming to d5, you're going to pile up on the pin piece. Uh, but it was uh, Alexenko's best, uh, best hope. Uh, here, Alexenko played knight captures on f6 instead. Uh, he... Uh, gives up uh, the <laughs> the knight here, and uh, he finds an even deadlier line, uh, which is uh, well, which is just very interesting. Here uh, we have f captures on g5, and now knight to g4, and uh, here uh, you don't really you don't really have a good reply. Uh, whatever you do here, uh, it's just it's just over for white. So uh, all of a sudden. Uh, that's uh, that's what happens when you when you find such an f6 line and well there there just is no good good move for Rublevsky here. Uh, Rublevsky played h captures on g4, but even if you play something like queen to f1, just the 
queen captures, rook captures on f1, rook captures, king captures, you pick up the rook with check, king has to move, and now you capture the c2 pawn. Uh, it's uh, just a completely winning endgame for black. You're, you're, you're up a pawn and you're up the exchange. Uh, so here after knight to g4, uh, uh, Rublevsky played h captures on g4, but now it's the same. Queen f2 check, we have king to h1 and queen captures on e3. Uh, so yes, now you do have uh, two uh, two knights for a rook, uh, but it doesn't matter. Here we have knight to c4, attacking the queen, but just, uh, well, uh, feel free to pause the video and try to find it. It's a, it's a forced mate in, uh, in five, so uh, I, I will give you a couple of seconds to, to spot it. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on finding a nice mate in five. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, uh, queen to f3 is results in mate, mate in five. Alexenko found mate in six. He played queen to h3 check, which works uh, just, as, just as well. King g1 and now queen captures on g4 with check. King back to h1 and here he played rook to f2. And uh, it was in this position that Sergei Rublevsky resigned the game as there is no defense against queen to h3 followed by queen to h2 mate. Whatever you play, there is really no point in uh, even trying to defend this. If the queen blocks, then you even uh, block your own escape square for the king. So you have to, again, the, the same mate follows. Uh, so yeah, this is one of the games I wanted to show you. Really complicated game. And uh, like I said, uh, at this position, uh, when bishop to d4 was played, knight to d5 was a known move by Alexenko versus uh, Alexei Sarana. And knight to e2 followed by this g3 idea and the uh, uh, knight f5 was uh, a prepared poison by Rublevsky and uh, Alexenko was able to refute it and, uh, well, in the, in, in the end win the game very nicely after this rook to f2 move. So that's uh, the, the one I found. I, I checked a few games. This is the one I really enjoyed as it features a really, really powerful attack and, you know, uh, you uh, Alexenko defended and uh, was able to win the game. And like I promised, here is the open letter from MVL's manager to the Russian Chess Federation. We're just going to read it. So... Uh, let's uh, dive straight into it. So there you have it, an open letter to the Russian Chess Federation. It says, qualification for the candidates tournament to be held in Yekaterinburg, uh, March to, uh, 2020, concluded yesterday in Jerusalem. Uh, congratulations to Yanni Pomnichi for winning the tournament and for taking the seventh qualifying spot. Uh, the eighth uh, and last place will be awarded by the organizers to a player eligible according to FIDE rules, the wild card, a questionable privilege that we hope will disappear for the next world championship cycle. On November 11th, in a press conference announcing the Russian international chess events uh, of 2020, uh, the president of the Russian Chess Federation, uh, Andrei Filatov, uh, had stated that he was pleased with the organization of the candidates tournament in Yekaterinburg because it guaranteed the presence of a Russian player. The situation has changed since then, and Sasha Grishuk and Yanni Pomnichi uh, both qualified via the FIDE Grand Prix. Uh, the Russian Chess Federation could therefore choose to give the wild card to the only eligible Russian player, Kirill Alexenko, uh, for his third place at the Grand Swiss that took place on the Isle of Man. But on a purely sporting level, it could legitimately pick Maxim Vashiel Lagrave, uh, MVL for short, uh, three times eligible and first non qualified player by 2019 average rating, 2019 World Cup, and 2019 FIDE Grand Prix. Uh, whether it opts for a third Russian player or for the most obvious sporting choice, the Russian Chess Federation remains uh, sovereign in its decisions. However, we suggest it takes into consideration the possibility of organizing a MVL Alexenko match in order to earn the wildcard spot. It would have the merit of per, uh, preserving sporting equity and would, I believe, meet the wishes of a vast majority of chess enthusiasts uh, throughout the world. Uh, there you have it, uh, Laurent Verat, uh, MVL's manager. So there you have it. Uh, that's the open letter to the Russian Chess Federation. Now, what are your thoughts on this? Should, uh, should they uh, give the wildcard to Alexenko? Should they give it to MVL, who is most likely the, the 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 obvious choice if we don't follow the rules or would you guys enjoy uh, seeing a short match let's say uh, uh, maybe a four game or an eight game match uh, Alexenko versus MVL uh, to, to determine who gets the last spot in the candidates term in 2020 so what are your uh, what are your thoughts on this I'm very interested uh, do share in the comment section below you know uh, maybe 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 so, someone has a really really brilliant idea uh, that, that we can share and maybe they use that who knows 
Uh, but yeah, that's the game and the open uh, letter to the Russian Chess Federation. I do hope you enjoyed that as well. Uh, I would like to thank Kuro Chess Club for your contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching and I will see you soon continuing the uh, coverage of the Sunway Sieges, which already finished, but we do have to check up on, on uh, good old Anton Korobov and Chucky, uh, checking up on your wonderful suggestions and whatever else happens in the chess world, um, meaning uh, the World Blitz and Rapid Championship. So thank you all, I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day.